First reading on um, battery acid. Take a drop of battery acid, put it on the refractometer, you're going to get a reading. So, if you understand logic, that means that Brix is not testing sugar because there's no sugar in battery acid, right? You can get a Brix reading on vinegar, on olive oil, on seawater. Um, it's, it's telling you how much light bends when it passes through the fluid. And when it comes to plant sap, sugar is one of the major ingredients that's causing the light to bend, so people simplify it sometimes and say it's, a, it's, a sugar, it's testing sugar, but that's not, not what it's testing. It's one of my little, I don't have any pet peeves, but that's one of them. <laughs> Do not tell me that Brix is measuring sugar. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Try to be gentle about it, but I just <laughs> <laughs> people who know better, people who know better and really should know better, repeat that publicly in front of hundreds of people, and it pisses me off. I'm like, you know that's not true. Why are you telling people this? Well, that's well, well, well. <laughs> anyway, um, all right. So uh, next topic on the agenda is inoculation. Um, we discussed this already to some degree. Um, I didn't give you the sort of the general, um, you know, the, the basic basic points. I said inoculation. Um, inoculating your seed is like um, giving colostrum to a baby. Um, it is it is critical, foundational for um, establishing good, healthy gut flora for the plant. Um, I would say that inoculation of seed is probably the most valuable, the least expensive, the most powerful best bang for your buck, lowest hanging fruit of any strategy I'm going to tell you about in this whole two-day course. Mm. This is it. Inoculation of seed. Giving your baby's colostrum. Right? It's so simple. It takes so little time. It takes so little money. Um, it, there's, there's no reason not to do it. Um, it's, it's, it, it is absolutely low hanging fruit. Um, so let me just walk you through this. Uh, I don't think I've got a packet of colostrum or inoculants here. Um, <laughs> But, you know, an ounce of inoculant would be about that much in the bottom of this jar. Um, that would be, you know, on the open market, like six, eight, ten bucks. Um, that's enough for 50 to 100 pounds of seed. Um, that has a lifetime, you know, like it'll be good for about 10,000 years. Um, it's spore forms of bacteria and fungi in a, you know, in a dry, in a, in a plastic container. They can ride meteorites, you know, across solar systems and go through, you know, being meteors and still and wake up and turn um, Spores can make it through a nuclear holocaust much better than cockroaches. Um, you know, the cost is nominal. The, the value is completely maintained much longer than you're ever going to use it for. Um, it's a, it's a, it is very, very few reasons not to inoculate your seed, um, except that your plants will be sicker and you're more likely to need fertilizers and other products, as far as I'm concerned. Um, this is an absolutely valuable um, tool in the toolbox. Um, some people are familiar with the concept of inoculating their beans and peas with bean and pea inoculant, which is usually Zonobacter and Rhizobacter, I believe, two species of nitrogen fixers that colonize the um, nodules. So um, if you're familiar with that concept, then all you're doing is using a much broader spectrum of species. I would like to see, you know, 30 or 40 species of bacteria, at least 15 or 20 species of fungi, um, you know, 10 or 15 families of each um, that are broad spectrum that you can use for your cucumbers and your tomatoes and your apples and your blueberries. Just a broad spectrum. Let's get some of all these basic families in on the seed. And that's going to be much more beneficial than not. Right? The process is extremely simple. You just open the container of inoculant, you open the container of seed, and you take a pinch of inoculant and you put it into the seed. And then you close the seed packet, and then you shake it up. And you're done. Wow. You, you do that for all of your seed? Yes. Full stop. Do you recommend using general inoculant for also the legumes that normally have a specific inoculant? The specific inoculant of legumes is just to facilitate the nitrogen fixation. So yes, I would use a broad, a multi, you know, a broad spectrum inoculant for all seeds that I'm planting. Um, I personally use inoculant when I'm transplanting also, and when I'm, and I'll do it on the foliar spray on the leaves, at least once or twice during the growing season. So I want to inoculate the leaf surface, I want to inoculate the, the whole, um, and and I want to inoculate the seed. 
but the seed is the most powerful, easiest, cheapest um, bang for your buck. So let's just start there. Um, really, really easy, um, really, really inexpensive, and um, the systemic, you know, knock-on effects are, are um, it's, 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 it's really exciting. I mean, it's really exciting. Yeah. Do you use a different kind of inoculant for a foliar spray than you would a yes. seed? Yes, absolutely, because the seed is going to be basically the, it's the root yeah. gut flora. Yeah. It's like, do you have the same species in your belly as you have on your skin? No. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you understand that, then yes. So a good foliar inoculant, you'll want to do once or twice. I will be talking tomorrow about how to make your own inoculants, harvest them from the local um, bioregion. It's very simple, totally free. Um, it requires you to go for a walk. Um, so, so you're not even doing a seed soak. You just put it in there, shake it up, and it coats each seed with the... Uh, I will talk about seed soaking tomorrow morning. Um, that's amazing. But um, this is really simple and yeah. really powerful. Um, there's a few of these things out there that I, you know, it's like open in the literature, the data is categorical, and no one's talking about it. Um, or not many people are talking about it. So these are the kind of things I really enjoy talking about because they're new information and they're just so powerful, so valuable, so beneficial. Um, and we can get that through BFA for your... That will be... So the depots are available to members. So the depots have not just rock minerals like green sand and gypsum and copper sulfate and, and cobalt, um, but also inoculants and foliar sprays and nutrient trenches. Um, we're basically trying to put together a full spectrum of uh, amendments for farmers, um, farmers gardeners, and uh, all certified that organic, only certified that organic materials um, um, at the best price that we can. Right. So, yeah, it's uh, certainly not a money-making venture, um, but <laughs> we're, we're basically going to cover our expenses. And cons the idea is, if we get people to join the organization, then, you know, and we actually are providing value, then hopefully a lot of people will join the organization, and then we can pay ourselves um, by membership dues, which means we don't have to worry about foundations and all the, you know, vagaries of that. So, um, that's the idea, is to have a grassroots right. organization, and if you're a member, you can devote for the board of directors, and the board of directors hires the staff. I mean, it's like democratic, you know, <laughs> proper, <laughs> uh, that's the idea. So it's building out nicely. It's actually coming along very nicely. Um, and uh, my only concern is that I'm not going to have enough time to farm in the next couple of years if I keep on with this trajectory. But I'm sure I'll be able to fit it in around the edges. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting better and better delegating. Um, okay, so uh, on the topic of, of nitrogen, just because it's uh, something people are familiar with, um, I don't think I said this today. Uh, where's the book? Um, it's white. It's a big one. Right there. Soil microorganisms and higher plants. That white one right there. Um, that was. That's a. You can. You can. Uh, you can take it out. Um, that is the compilation of. Um, it's a reprint, a translation of a Russian researcher named Krasilnikov, a Russian microbiologist named Krasilnikov's work. Um, he had identified by the time I was born, in the 70s, 2,000 species of nitrogen fixers, bacteria and fungi, that were symbiotes with all families of plants. By the mid-70s, 2,000 species that worked with all kinds of plants. So we have this concept that nitrogen is fixed by legumes, and otherwise you have to add it. And I ask you the question, who is adding nitrogen fertilizer to the forest? Where is all, are all plants legumes? Is there a succession of legumes in the forest that's keeping the plants? No. <laughs> Nature evolved the capacity for plants to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere by feeding nitrogen fixers on their leaf surface, on the bark of the tree, on the roots. Um, these species are you know, endemic, they're natural. Plants have evolved this functional capacity since long before humans ever were considered. Um, so my, my perspective is I don't add nitrogen as, on my farm. I feel like if I do add nitrogen, that makes me a cheater. Um, that I'm getting, it's like, I'm already making easy money, but that would be even more easy money. Um, actually, if you add too much nitrogen, you, that is the root cause of a lot of diseases, right? The imbalance of too much nitrogen and not enough of the other things is what makes the plants weak and sappy and then digestible for the insects in the first place. So, um, anyway, um, there is a 
a mineral piece in this process, um, the, there's an enzyme that is used to take the nitrogen from the atmosphere and, and to gas and turn it into, I think it's nitrate. Um, um, and that is called the nitrogenase enzyme. Um, and we also talk about enzymes now. Um, but the nitrogenase enzyme is a compound that has, at the center of it, one atom of molybdenum. And molybdenum is one of the elements on your soil test form, which you may have wondered why it was on your soil test form. Um, you need one part per million of molybdenum in your soil. That's two pounds of molybdenum in an acre. And that's enough molybdenum to facilitate all the nitrogen fixation you could ever need. Two pounds of molybdenum per acre is enough to have enough nitrogenase enzymes present in the plants to f work with, this, with the bacteria and fungi to fix all the nitrogen you need. Right? That's what you need. You need the microbiology to be present and functioning, and you need this enzyme to be present. And there are currently a million pounds of molybdenum sold this year, uh, sorry, every year, in bean and pea inoculant packets. In your bean and pea inoculant packet is molybdenum. They don't tell you because you didn't ask. But the inoculant wouldn't work if there wasn't molybdenum there because the, the microbe needs the molybdenum at the center of the enzyme to do its job. So if you don't have any molybdenum in your soil, you can add inoculants all day long, but you're not going to get the effect. It's the molybdenum in the soil that actually is critical for that process to occur. Uh, a million pounds every year sold in this country in bean and pea inoculant packets. Look it up. Yeah. Is there a specific enzyme, like one specific enzyme? The nitrogenase, nitrogenase enzyme is called. Okay. Yeah, that the molybdenum is in the center of. And if you don't have enough molybdenum, then you need vanadium. Vanadium. If you don't have enough molybdenum, then you need vanadium. That's even harder to come by. I don't have enough on my soil test. Right. So that's why I taught you how to read a soil test and make them and make the recommend and come up with your recommendations. And then you can say, oh look, I need one pound of sodium molybdate per acre for my property. It doesn't take much. One pound per acre is a is a yearly dose. Right? A very, very small amount will facilitate your nitrogen fixation um, from the atmosphere. Um, I don't know if anybody else is excited by this. We all keep it very very flat, flat faces here. But <laughs> very excited. Very I think this is totally radical. Come on. We can, this is how we take out Monsanto. Oh, yeah. I'm not worried about fighting them. I'm worried about creating a reality where no one's giving them money anymore and they don't have any power to do anything bad. We don't fight Monsanto, we don't beat Monsanto by fighting them, we beat them by creating a reality where they're no longer relevant. They're no longer relevant when the farmers are not buying their products anymore because they don't need them. Mm -hmm. We create that reality by educating the farmers and educating the consumers and making that connection so they don't buy those products in the first place. You can't produce high quality crops if you're applying a pesticide or a herbicide or a fungicide. Side means kill. Kill takes out microbiology, dead microbiology means the plants aren't being fed, means you can't get high quality crops. So if we have consumers choosing which crops to purchase based on quality and the whole supply chain, then we have a very strong economic driver pushing people away from purchasing these toxic chemicals. Um, for me, this is how you play the real game. This is real politics. This is straight up Machiavellian leverage. Like, how, we're not screwing around here. We're going for the jugular. This is to me how you do it. Totally peaceful, totally you know, open, kind, talking about nature and life and supporting building that reality. And that's how you, you know, t suck the life force out of the old paradigm. Hopefully. Anyway, yes. <clears throat> they pass a law and say you can't use lithium or Good luck. Or... What? Good luck. Good luck. Well, they're already going to make mandatory vaccination and other things. People don't want that. That's what I'm saying. It's going to be possible. Thank God for uh, Thoreau, civil disobedience. There's a time and place for civil Conflict. disobedience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll take your kids out of school. Oh, wait, they're in school in the first place. So. Oh, yeah. Well, too. I think they yeah. too. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure why I didn't want to put them in school. I never did. <laughs> uh, so far, I've been able to maintain without. Yes. Um, all right. That's inoculation. Are they good on inoculation? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all right. What time is it? Right. I'm curious. 247. 247. Okay, let's do seed and then we can break. Um, 
So seed, we go from inoculation, which is one of the easiest, uh, you know, cheapest, um, low, most low-hanging fruit, um, to seed, which is one of the most intransigent, difficult, um, you know, issues that is also extremely powerful and valuable. Um, uh, my, my perspective on seed is that um, it is very, very important. Um, most cultures worth their salt considered their seed stock to be their, um, you know, their Bible and their Bhagavad Gita and their, you know, um, you know all their, their, their wisdom, their knowledge, their, the wealth of their civilization was their seed. Um, and in this culture we have commodified it to a remarkable degree. Um, um, and I think part and parcel of that has been a deep weakening of the seed. Um, um, I know when I was a younger farmer, I would uh, look in various seed catalogs to see which one has the least expensive, um, you know, uh, what's that classic purple tomato, heirloom tomato, Cherokee, Cherokee. not Cherokee, Prudence. Um, what is it? Prudence purple. Prudence purple, no, even more, even more classic. Anyway, um, the heirloom tomato. Brand new one. Thank you. Ten years ago, no one heard of heirloom tomatoes. They knew about brand new ones, right? So I would look in the seed catalog for, you know, purple brand new ones, and I'd see, okay, well, this one's a buck fifty, and that one's only eighty-five cents. Now I'm going to buy the eighty-five cents brand new ones because, <laughs> like, why would I pay the extra, you know, <laughs> the sixty-five cents? I don't really want. There's no reason to. Um, um, if you understand the effect of the health of the mother when she's pregnant on the baby, then you understand the uh, import of sourcing seed from healthy mother plants. Um, if a woman is pregnant and on chemotherapy because she's got, you know, stage three cancer, like you can guess that child's probably going to be, you know, struggle. Um, you know, say that woman's mother was, you know, um, not on chemotherapy, on some other heavy duty drug, I'm not sure what, you know, you know an example. But through two or three generations um, of sick mothers, we should not be surprised that we have sick babies. Um, my understanding is of most seed, um, they need to spray fungicides, they need to spray insecticides, because otherwise the plants won't make it till their seed is um, ready. Mm. You know about this? One of the biggest issues in organic seed production is they can't get the plants to live long enough. You know about this? Yeah. No, one of the biggest struggles in organic seed production, why there's a lot of varieties that aren't available, is because they can't get organic plants to live long enough to bear seed. Right? They're, they're so susceptible to disease. And in the conventional system, they just spray the living daylights out of the plants. For me, if you're dying from a, from, you know, if you've got a, a disease which is killing you, and you're pregnant, and you're on some serious chemical regimen to keep you alive until your baby's born, like that, like should logically tell you that you're probably going to have a sick baby. But either way, um, if you think about it that way, I think it really it, it brings the point home. Um, I was talking to a guy named uh, John Navazio who helped start the Organic Seed Alliance. He's now working at Johnny's on, on breeding. Um, he's uh, sort of been in the organic seed industry, actually in the seed industry for 30 or 40 years. He's like from Oregon, really wrote a really good book on seed saving. He's a really good guy. Um, so a couple years ago, I was actively pursuing this topic um, and calling people up and, and you know pressing for information and details. And, and he shared with me um, his understanding about how seed industry works. So I just want to give you a quick quick summation of, of one piece of that uh, puzzle. I think he gave me the example of Thai yeast spinach, which is uh, sort of an old standard. Um, it's a, it's a, actually, it's a, it's a hybrid, but it's an old, old hybrid um, spinach variety. He said there's two farmers in the country, and they're both in Oregon, that grow all the Thai yeast spinach seed for the planet. Thai is owned by a company. They hire two farmers to grow all the seed. When those farmers harvest the seed, they give it to the company. And the company then puts that seed through a series of what's called screens to sort it. And the biggest, best seed is kept for themselves. The 14 screen seed, we'll call the 12 screen seed. A screen size, if you know like a screen, screen door, right, it's got little, those little holes. 
but there's that one inch wire mesh, right? It's like a screen, but just bigger. So envision these screens, the 12 screens got a decent sized hole, there's a 10 screen, an 8 screen, a 6 screen. So the 12 screen seed is kept for themselves. The 10 screen seed, the stuff that's too big to fit through a 10 screen, goes to their buddies in the Salinas Valley that plant 50 acres of spinach at a time. Then the stuff that is will fit through and won't fit through an eight screen is um, sold to farmers maybe in New York State who plant 50 pounds of seed at a time. And then the seed that will not fit through a six screen is the stuff that companies like Johnny's and Fedco and High Mowing purchase and sell to what's called the packet trade. And those are the seeds that will germinate mostly. Um, but what's happened by the time we get access to these seeds through the supply chain is that the <laughs> everything but the runts of the litter have already been sorted out. Um, and when you order seeds, that's pretty much what you're getting. That's pretty much what you can choose between is, you know, the somewhat less runt-like runts and the total runts. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure, anybody ever grown um, dill and not planted the whole packet of dill and noticed the size of the dill seeds? that they grew next to the size of the dill that was in the seed packet. Anybody here done that? Huge yeah. difference. Just like four times. Three, four times bigger, right? In one generation, you take those runts, you plant them in your soil, you grow them out, and you harvest that seed, and it is dramatically increased in size. And dill is an easy one to see because the seeds are so big. Um, but it is not at all hard to produce for yourself much superior quality seed than you can purchase on the open market right now, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, I've done this experiment in a few different manners. Um, I, one, one way I did it was with uh, arugula a couple of years ago. I did this sort of, I was just, you know, I've been, I was actively struggling and studying and trying to figure out where I could get good seed and where I could tell people to go get good seed because I think seed's really important. Um, and I was, you know, frustrated because I couldn't find anywhere. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try it myself and see what happens. And so I did a really a classic Dan-like, you know, do no work and see what happens strategy. Um, I bought four pounds of arugula seed from Johnny's in the spring. I planted three pounds in one big planting. I you know, grew that arugula, I picked it three or four times, five times, whatever it was, until my next planting came on. And then I just left it. I didn't mow it, didn't till it, didn't plant anything else there, I just let it be. Just, just didn't do anything. Um, and it was early enough in the year when I planted it that it was able to go through its full life cycle. Um, and form seed heads, and they were and they dried down. And um, that point was a point where I did the only thing, which was to pull the plants out and to shake them over an old piece of greenhouse plastic. And then I took that greenhouse plastic and sort of poured the seeds and some you know dirt balls and things that came down with them into a couple one quart euro containers, and then planted that seed next to the one pound that I hadn't planted in the spring. So basically, I had a control. It wasn't exactly a control, but it was, you know, kind of a control. Um, and it was so categorical, the improvement in vigor. Has anybody planted arugula and had this experience with, like, the leaves turn yellow and turn purple and fail to thrive on a regular basis? Yeah. And you're like, <laughs> please, arugula, come on. <laughs> Why are you so difficult? <laughs> It was so black and white. I mean, the seed that I had saved, which I had just not saved, I just not let it, not killed it, it grew bigger, there was no purpling, there was no yellowing. Um, it, it was, it was, I don't know, it was probably the beginning of September when I planted it, and so it was getting on, sometime in October, it was getting cold when I started to pick it, and when I started picking it, the stuff, my seed was ready to go, was the, the plants were ready to pick, and the Johnny's seed was, you know, maybe a third, a third the size, literally, Categorical, dramatic improvement in vigor, vitality, thickness of leaf, you know, speed of growth, lack of discoloration. Just it was categorical the improvement in vigor, and I didn't do anything but just let it be. Um, and you know, I will suggest that probably I have decent, well-functioning soil and good, basically good mineral balance. And I did a decent job with, you know, inoculation and, and taking care of and feeding the plants when I was growing them, um, but. Um, my experience has been that it's really quite easy to save seed um, and um, and dramatically increase the vigor of your crop. So um, that's one that's one thing I want to say. Um, you know, until there's a good 
company out there which is actually selling high quality seed, I think it's really important that we take responsibility mm -hmm. for um, the full circle. Um, it's just, if you start with crappy seed every year, you know, all the rest of the good work you're doing, there's your limiting factor. That's your, that's the low, you know, the low stave in the, in the barrel. It's not going to get above 30%. You know, all the rest of the good management you do, if you don't deal with your seed quality, you're never going to get um, the rest of the things up and running, up, up where they could be. So, um, yeah, so one thing I suggest you do is, if you are going to be buying seed, most of, us, most of us do, it's coming up to that time of year, when you call your seed companies, if you've got two or three you choose from, um, call them and ask them for the test weight or the seed size for the batch they've got. Um, I think this is actually a really good democratic act. Um, we know what squeaky wheels get in the grease. You know that if you call your representative, um, it may not turn out to do anything. If you call your seed company and you start giving them a hard time about seed size, uh, I think it's likely to, you know, if enough people do it, they may actually move on it. Um, so basically, uh, I'll just give you a quick example. I, what I would do, so in the case of arugula, I'll call up Johnny's and I'll say I'm looking for astro arugula. Um, you have a, a test rate on the batch you're selling right now. You say, yeah, it's click, click, click. You can hear it on the computer, you know. Um, it's on a separate page, they have to check. Uh, yep, 250,000 seeds per pound. Um, they know these things, they don't tell you. It's not that they don't know it, because it's all come through the supply chain. All these numbers are all in the back in the back end. And you, if you ask for it, you can get it. I say, thank you very much, and I hang up. Then I call um, Fedco, and I say, Fedco, I'm looking for Astro Arugula. Do you have a test weight on the batch you're selling right now? They say, click, 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 yep, 275,000. Thank you very much, hang up. Call high mowing, say high mowing, I'm looking for astro arugula. Do you have, you know, what's this test weight on the size you on the stuff you've got? They say click click click, three hundred thousand. Thank you very much. Hang up. Who do I call up and buy it from? Johnny's. Johnny's. The fewest seeds per pound is the best vigor. The bigger the seed, the fewer the seeds per pound is the best vigor. Now you can do this, you can do this yourself. Has anybody ever planted tomato seeds? Anybody yeah. plant tomato seeds? Sure. Yeah, of course. No, I mean, that's a question. Um, have you seen some seeds germinate between like day five and seven, and then a whole bunch more germinate between day twelve and fourteen or ten and twelve? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the ones that germinated between day ten and fourteen were the runts, and those are the ones you should dispose of. Those are the ones that will never grow with vigor. They will be most susceptible to infestation and disease. That's, that's a great that's, distinction. I it's really simple. That. It's really simple. Yeah. And you can do it, if you take the seeds in your hand, mm -hmm. you can look at them, and you can take the big ones, the fat ones, and plant them over here, and the flat ones, and plant them over here, and you can predict all these will germinate between days 5 and 7, and all these will germinate between day 10 and 14. You can do it. You can do it by looking at the seed. Um, if you don't want to, it's too much work, you're planting too many seeds. I would suggest um, culling at that point. Mm -hmm. Starting to cull at that point it's very difficult, I'm not sure if anyone else has a hard time killing seedlings. Um, it's like killing a chicken or something, you know? It's like, I, it's like a baby <laughs> chick, a old chick. Like, I can't kill you. <laughs> I know you're a rooster and you're a legger and you're never going to be a pain in my ass forever, but I still can't kill you. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. So, um, you know, find spots around where you can just take your seedlings and put them in the ground and they'll just grow and maybe some of them will make it or something. Um, it's great to have tomatoes go wild, I think, mm -hmm. um, and let them self-seed, and then, and then that'll be great. Um, anyway, so that's one thing you can do is you can call. Another thing you can do is you can call your seed companies and give them a hard time and get the best quality available. Another thing you can do is um, save your own seed. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about here is spacing. Um, um, where's that book? How to Grow Whole Bucket Tomatoes. Have you seen this book before? No. This is a great little picture book. You can just look at this one picture in the back, and that'll tell you the whole story. Um, this guy is a, a redneck. He was a, he was a uh, no, he wasn't white trash. He was a redneck. He was a country boy from Alabama, and he wanted to get the Guinness Book of World Records. And so he just decided to pay close attention to tomatoes and see if he could grow a lot of tomatoes. And um, and uh, you know a lot of these things like taking care of this, the best seed and saving his seed and doing a good job with transplants and all this kind of stuff. You know, keeping the plants moist and 
good conductivity and all that kind of stuff. He was able to grow on with five plants, maybe it was four plants, four plants, five foot spacing, uh, 1,368 pounds of tomatoes. <laughs> um, do the math on how many pounds per plant, and it's north of 300 pounds per plant, 28 feet tall to 32 feet tall. Um, uh, in one year, one growing season, obviously it's Alabama, so it's got a little bit of longer growing season, but still, 300 plus pounds per plant, um, five foot spacing, one plant there.